recording our sessions for those who uh, want to take it home after. I'll leave it with Bob, and he will make it available to however, however you want to distribute it. Good to see you this morning. Can you hear me okay? If you can't, just come, come closer, come up to the front here, and we can see each other's face. And Actually, I'm going to move forward, a little further to the front. That helps me. Well, it's good to be here with you today, and we just trust in the Lord to take us by the heart and lead us, maybe places we've never been before, and we want to be transformed. And I, this last song is one of my favorites, written by David Roos, of we want, to, we want to experience this glory, but it's not for us. It's to be taken out to the nations. It's to be given away. There are people who are living in such darkness that they can't find a lighthouse, and Unless we take a bucket of light to them and, and show them and find them, find them so that they can find the Lord, they just, they're just in such darkness. And so this glory isn't for us just to feel good. It's not just to have a, a tingle down our spine or goosebumps. It's to give away. It's to, it's, people are changed by the glory of the Lord. And when they uh, experience him, they can never be the same. They can never be the same. And we want them to be touched by him. Well, we're going to be teaching about uh, a life in the Holy Spirit and, and how he impacts us, gives us tools that can outdo and undo the works of darkness, and, and we, we need those tools. tools. We need power tools. Uh, let's begin our study this morning in Acts 19. Can we do that? Acts chapter 19. Beginning in verse 1, this is a story of the Apostle Paul going to Ephesus. He'd passed through there once before, uh, leaving off uh, a couple of people that were precious to him, Priscilla and Aquila, were working there. And and, uh, he comes back and finds a group of people. There's at least 12 men. We don't know how many wives, children, uh, other people that are there, but there's 12 men. He gathers them together, and uh, uh, this is his first meeting with them. And this, he doesn't know it at the time, but this is going to be the beginning of uh, one of the greatest churches in first century Christianity. And it begins with just a, a handful of people. And he stands in front of them, and he, he asks them in verse 2, he asks them a question. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed. Now the translation says, Did you receive the Holy, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? I'm not sure what it says in your Bible. But it's a, it's a profound question on a number of levels. Regardless of the translation, what we see is, is the priority of Paul, that having the Holy Spirit is, is significant, is huge. And it's his first question. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Some translations, have you re- did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? There are lots of people who believe that when you receive Jesus, you receive everything that there is to receive. And this question reveals that Paul didn't think that. Paul, Paul believed from this question that you can have an experience with Jesus and then have a, an experience with the Holy Spirit, and we need both. We must have both. And so he gets right to the point. Can I ask you? Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? It's a very important question. They, they said, we don't, we don't know anything about this Holy Spirit. And he was a little taken back, and he said, then, whose baptism were you baptized with? And they said, John's, 20 years ago. He said, well, John, he said, you needed to be baptized by him who's coming after. And they said, okay. They were just so pliable. See, John's baptism was so 
so effective in, in softening people's hearts. If you can imagine one young man uh, out in the wilderness, and people would come, people would come from uh, Jerusalem, from Judea, and all around that place in Jer- uh, Judea. Uh, he had the largest congregation in the world, and they were coming to him. They were making a pathway into the wilderness to come out, and they would camp for days. And even Jesus was camping there. He had a, a little place in the wilderness where he was camping, and the disciples wanted to see where he was camping. And, and they would come out. Families would camp there. And they had never seen or heard anything like this before. The, the glory of the Lord was there. And John would, would describe the mercy of the Father, and describe what the Father was like. And there would be liquid waves of love that would wash over the people, causing them to be willing to draw near to the Lord. And, and what he required of them, it was such a challenge, he didn't make it easy for them. He said, you need to come, to the, you need to come up here, take some steps this way, and publicly confess your sins. And they did. And then he took them and laid them down in the water in a way that they had never experienced before. And it was radical. It was different. It was abstract. It was out of the norm. It wasn't something that they'd ever seen. It wasn't part of uh, Jewish tradition. They had lavers and the, and the priests would wash. There were ceremonies. But this was different. This, this was costly. And they had to make this kind of a statement publicly in front of all their friends and and because of that, because God didn't make it easy, he gave John this revelation, because you can say anything. You can say you believe, but this, this is different. This shows that you believe something. This, this is a proof. You wouldn't do this unless you actually really did believe something. And they said, we've had that experience, and it's carried us all this time. And they had a community, and, and Paul's looking at them, and he's thinking, they're not typical Jews. They're not typical Gentiles. They're, they're followers. Uh, they're trying to get close to the Lord. They're living in some kind of community. He assumed that they were believers. And so he asked them, he said, whose baptism? They said, John's. And he said, John said to be baptized by him who is coming after. And they're so open and so pliable that they don't debate it. They don't argue. They don't, they don't need proof of this. John's word was right. They heard John say that. They, and they just said, we will do that. And so uh, Paul took them and baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so that's the moment that they become Christians. So then we keep reading. And uh, verse 6, he laid hands on them. And the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And what this tells me is is people weren't argumentative. They weren't saying, you know, uh, um, (coughs) prove anything to me. They just they just took the simplicity of it like like children at face value. And that's that's a wonderful work that John's baptism had done. It had softened the hearts so they could see and they could hear the only people who weren't baptized by by John were the Pharisees, and they're the only people who couldn't perceive Jesus. They couldn't get him. But the ordinary people, their hearts had become softened. Some of the, some of the impediments to faith were removed. And, it, and we could see evidence of that 20 years later. He lays hands on them. The Holy Spirit comes. They begin speaking in tongues, though they've never heard it before. They didn't have a seven-week course on how to speak in tongues. They didn't, what part of the, part of the life in the spirit course that they didn't take, you know, it, they weren't taught how to prophesy or how to be open to prophecy. It was spontaneous. They had no forethought. They were so open and so pliable that the Holy Spirit could, could speak through them in an instant. See, it it tells me something. It it tells me that our openness, our childlikeness, uh, a non-resistance on our part that just says, whatever you want, whatever whatever you say, whatever you want, I want that. And you could just see that he could do something 
at a, at a greater rate because of their childlikeness, their openness, their pliability, than if they had to be, you know, everything had to be proved. He didn't have to prove anything. I, uh, I was up in a, a place called White Lake, Ontario, in, uh, above Arm Prior. And uh, a friend of mine said, there's a bunch of men who would be willing to spend a weekend uh, in, this, in this camp or cottage. There's no, no electricity. There's no roads to get there. You had to get there by boat. It was just on the shore of White Lake, and it was in the middle of nowhere. And uh, uh, so no, no big meals or nothing comfortable. They just camp, bring their sleeping bags. But I've got a group of men who are hungry for God. And if you would camp with us and spend a weekend with us and just teach us and talk with us, all these guys, they want to go further in the Lord. And so that appeals to me. And so, so I signed on. I went up there, and, and the first night was great, and great fellowship and openness and people uh, talking and praying. Well, early in the morning, I, I got my Bible, and I went down before anyone would get up and, and just wanted to sit in some sunny spot and pray. And, and, but I, there was, when I got there, there was a, a guy sitting in this big overstuffed chair. And he'd been there early, much earlier than me. And uh, he was a, an Episcopalian young man. And he said, um, he said, I want everything. I want everything that God has. He said, would you, would you pray for me? I, I just, I want, I want Jesus. I want the Holy Spirit. I want him to use me. I want everything. And I was really moved that, Someone so early in the morning and so, you know, hadn't, we hadn't even had coffee yet. That's how open he is. <laughs> that he's just pliable and childlike. And, and with no forethought or no discussion, I, I just stepped up to him and, and laid my hand on his head. And he began to tremble. And he began to pray and, and, and receive Jesus into his heart and ask the Lord to come and live in, live in his heart. And I said, son, just, just ask for the Holy Spirit to come inside of you. And in the same way, on the same basis. And, and he said, Holy Spirit, come. come. Come live inside of me. Come have your way in me. Live in me. And immediately, he began to speak in tongues. And I don't think he'd ever heard it before. And I wasn't priming the pump by, you know, giving him some syllables to say. It, it had to be real. I mean, it was just so spontaneous and unplanned. And, and, and he's crying and speaking in tongues for the first time. And I, I felt like the Lord spoke into my heart and said, pray for him for prophecy. And, and I would never have done this before. I would have thought, you know, do the first part, then you grow in that, then eventually kind of in stages. That's the way I would think. Do it in stages. And and let them grow and appreciate their experience. But so I'd never, I'd never done this before. But I remember this section of scripture in Acts 19 that these people, they just prophesied right from day one. And so I said, "Son, do you want to prophesy?" He says, "Everything, everything." <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, "Okay." And this was all new for me. And so I, I laid my hands on him, and he began to prophesy. And it was real. It was, it was really the Lord. And, and um, part of the prophecy actually really impacted me. It wasn't aimed at me, but I benefited from it. We had um, we'd been doing outreach in, uh, in our village, and we always went to the poorest section of town. And we'd go door to door, and we'd sometimes under the guise of Christmas caroling and different things. We'd, we just wanted to get in their homes. We wanted to be with them and and see if they wouldn't come to church. And, and there's uh, wealthier parts of town that we'd avoid. And part of the prophecy that I never forgot, he said, some of the poorest people live in the nicest houses. And I thought, absolutely. I mean, that was a whole new way of thinking for me. Some of the poorest people live in the nicest houses. And from that moment on, I said, that's it. We're going we're gonna to go uptown and, and go door to door because there's poor people. They don't look poor, but they're poor. And, and that changed our whole strategy of how to do that. And that really came out of that. But 
my point in, in sharing this with you is that it's, it's, not, it's not knowledge. They didn't have any knowledge. It's childlikeness. It's simplicity. It's, it's a thing called yieldedness. When you're yielding in traffic terms is, is you give way. You give the right of way. You allow someone else to have their way. And it's really that. And if you can just grasp that, that, that initially it's just letting someone bigger than you, wiser than you, more powerful than you have their way. Now, and here's where I want to go with that. For the rest of your life. So that wherever you go in whatever situation you're in, you just, you, you really can't do anything. It's not your power. You're not wise enough. You, you won't be able to figure this out. But what you can do is you can revert to simplicity. You can revert to, to childlikeness. You can revert to a place where you say, Lord, I can't, but you can. Touch them. Speak, speak through me in this situation. And life gets really interesting because it's not you being some powerful force to reckon with or some seasoned, effective minister. It's just the more childish you can become, the the more simple you can become, the more yielded you can become. He can do anything. And so my my goal is just to try to capture the heart of these Ephesians of of just going to a place of, of simplicity. Take your hands together and, and lace your fingers together. Uh, I'll give you a, a lesson in, quick lesson in, in yieldedness. Um, squeeze till your knuckles are, are white and red. And, and, and that's, that's your heart. And that's my heart. Uh, that's, my, that's my heart today at the at coming up here and standing in front of you the honest truth is my heart is like that i, I get afraid I, I i never preach without being incredibly nervous and having to struggle with that it's just a great weakness in my life but what i want to do is i want to i want to bless you and i want to impact you and i want to i want to give to you and and the more i can yield and say lord do something in me. I'm standing here praying and saying, Lord, I, I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know what to say. I don't know what these people need, but you do use me. And, and as I pray that, just relax your hands a little bit. I, my heart goes to that and eventually to that. And it's been 30-some years that, that uh, you would think that after being having this experience, I would go from this and, and be like this continuously, open, constantly. But that's not my experience. That's not my experience. My experience, my goal is, is not that I'm like this all the time. My goal is that I can go from this to this a little quicker. But I always start with this. How much could you pour into that? How much can be poured out of that? Not very much. And, and our hearts are just that way. And so when Paul stands before these Ephesians, their hearts are like this. And he starts talking John. They love John. They know John. They trust John. John said this. John said that. That's okay. And so next thing you know, they go from this to this. And, and when he takes them into baptism, they go to this. And so when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, it's easy to receive and it's easy to have a fluency in, in this power of the Holy Spirit because their hearts are open. One of the reasons we invite people to come forward and we lay hands on them and they get touched by the Lord is we're just trying to get their hearts to open. We're just trying to get their hearts to receive. My own heart in this whole process, when I first started uh, seeking the baptism of the Spirit, I was so afraid of being deceived. I was so afraid of getting the wrong thing. I was afraid that you know, I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have anyone to guide me. I didn't have anyone to pray with me or talk with me through this. I was just reading the scriptures and realized, boy, this is important. I, I need to have this. And, and, and that I could have it completely overwhelmed me, that I was even a candidate for it, really was surprising to me. 
So I began seeking, but my heart was like this, and you can't receive much when your heart's like that. And then I, I, read, I read where John said that, that he that comes after me, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And I, I read and realized that it's Jesus, my friend. I, I trusted Jesus. And I, I just had to believe that if, if it's going to come from him, if he's the baptizer, I, I trust him. And so my heart began to relax a little bit. Then when I think about the speaking in tongues thing, it would go tight again. It would close up again. And I didn't know about that and how that would work. And, and I tell, tell you the truth, I was a little afraid. I thought, I thought I'd be like a fire hose. That if you said yes to this, he would turn on this, this nozzle and this fire hose of tongues would happen through me, kind of like automatic speech. And, and I thought, well, what if I'm in the supermarket? Or what if I'm, you know, this, this is going to happen to me. This is going to be very embarrassing. And and I can't already explain a lot of what's happening to me and my friends, and they're going to... And I just thought there'd be no control over it. And so that made me tighten up even more. And the more he began working with me and, 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 and helping me from Scripture, uh, the more I began to relax and began to... But I actually, I could only receive just a, a little bit because my heart was only open a little bit. And I misunderstood that. I thought... Oh, maybe he doesn't trust me with a whole lot. And so he's just giving me a little bit because he, he's, he thinks maybe I'll become proud or uh, become haughty all of a sudden. And, and so uh, I thought the fact that not a lot was happening was because he was withholding it from me, that I wasn't worthy. I didn't realize that I was the inhibitor. It was my own heart. Uh, he couldn't pour. He just, he, because he doesn't force anything. He doesn't make it, make you do anything. He, I thought he was going to take my tongue and start moving it, and I would have to do this. And I didn't, I didn't know what he was like, and I didn't realize how incredibly gentle he was. I didn't realize uh, that it, the, it, it is contrary to grace to make people do anything. It's contrary to the very nature of grace. Grace is always a, a cooperation that happens. God wants to use us. He wants us to cooperate with him. And so I had, little by little, one of the blocks, you know, I, I thought, well, what if I open my heart really wide, really open my heart, and maybe a demon will come in or something bad will come in. And, and then I happened to read where Jesus said, told the story. He said, if, if your father is evil and, and, and uh, you asked for bread, would he give you a stone? If you asked for a fish, would he give you a snake? He asked for an egg, would he give you a scorpion? Well, no. no. A good father, even a bad father, wouldn't do that. And I realized, well, that's, that means to me that, that I can trust the Lord, that in this moment, nothing bad's going to happen. That whatever I ask for, that's what I'm going to get, not something else. And it, it helped me to relax a little bit. And so I'm seeking the Lord, and I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm spending hours at a time trying to navigate all this, because I, I really didn't have anybody to help me. At least I didn't think I, I thought I could just do this all in my apartment. And I really wasn't getting very far. Yeah, I felt like it was a, I felt like it was an enormous struggle. This went on for, for uh, a week or two. Seemed like a long time. And I, I kept reading in here where um, people would experience the baptism of the Spirit when someone else would lay hands on them. I thought, well, maybe that's my problem. Maybe I don't want anyone, I don't want anyone to hear this or, or watch this happen. I didn't want to fail in front of anyone. That's, that's really the truth of it. I didn't want a, them to find out that God maybe disqualified me because of me. And uh, it just put a lot of pressure on me to think someone else would be there. But when I kept reading that someone laid hands on people, like Paul laid hands on them, and I came across that several times, I thought, maybe that's the problem. It would just take so much more humility on my part to do that in front of somebody, let somebody else pray for me. I, wasn't, I didn't have any aversion of someone laying hands on me. I just didn't want them to find out that God might not give it to me, that I wasn't worthy of it. 
And I, I, I wrestled with it, and I realized I needed to ask somebody else to pray for me. And that, that took a lot. And uh, I went to church, and one of the assistant pastors in the church, his name was Floyd Rude, and, and he was just a real humble guy, real, real beautiful pastor. And I, I just went up to him and I said, uh, Pastor Rude, I'm, I'm seeking God for the baptism of spirit. And I'm struggling with it. I'm just not able to get the breakthrough that I need. And, and um, would you be willing to lay hands on me? Well, I didn't know it, but that's music to a pastor's ear. When, when people want to be prayed for and people are asking and people are trying to go further in God, that's what you want. I thought he'd say, oh, you can't get there because you're no good or you're not good enough. And and I was surprised that he'd be just so willing and relaxed about it. And he said, absolutely. And already I was surprised. I thought I'd have to beg him to do it. And, 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 then, um, and then I was disappointed. I, all these thoughts kind of, I'd, I'd move from one to the other. I'm telling you kind of what was happening inside. Uh, I thought, well, great. Now this guy's going to help me to get through this. And, and I, I thought... Uh, I didn't want him to do this, but I expected this. I was kind of braced for it, that uh, when he would pray for me, he'd kind of rough me up a little bit, you know, just kind of really shake me and really kind of cram and, pr- and maybe push me down or something. But none of, he, he just put his hand on the middle of my back and raised his other hand, and he said, Father, baptize Pen with the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, aren't you going to mess up my hair? Or do, I mean, aren't you going <laughs> to... Aren't you going to do something kind of rough on me? You know, I, I didn't want him to do that. I mean, I didn't want it to be treated that way. But I was kind of expecting that was a kind of Pentecostal stereotype I had in my head. And, and he didn't do that. And I'm, I'm thinking, I was half disappointed. <laughs> and I'd, I'd, I'd prepared for that. I was going to brace my, lock my knees, the whole thing. And, and he didn't. It was just so simple. It was too simple. And I remember thinking... That's your whole prayer? <laughs> I've, I've prayed harder prayers than that for the, I mean, no tears. Oh, Father, bless Pam with the baptism of spirit. And I thought, it was just, I, I thought, I, I'd worked harder to, in prayer than he was. He was. <laughs> so there's another part of me, I was kind of disappointed. Then I thought, well, I don't want to disappoint him. He's so sincere. He's so sincere. I, I didn't want to disappoint him. And so I, I just, it was kind of like bungee jumping where you jump off the cliff. And I, I, that's really how I felt. I just said, just go for broke. Just, this is it. He's, he's praying so sincerely. And I just said, Father, I, I, I receive your Holy Spirit. And I, it was in a moment that I re- realized before I was begging, asking him to give it to me, this experience, Something switched that it was a whole different approach. All of a sudden, I just took. My posture was, was, I moved from asking to simply taking, receiving. That was huge. And I really think that was, that's what, that's what the difference was. It wasn't that he was withholding anything. I was afraid he might not give me the Holy Spirit. So I wanted him to see my tears and my earnestness, the sincerity of my heart. And I was trying to prove him that I was worthy, that this was, I wasn't going to wreck anything if, if he entrusted this experience to me. And, and uh, the idea of just simply taking as kind of like, kind of like someone standing there with a present and, and they're, they're standing there and they're extending it to you and they're extending it to you. And you're on the other side of it, begging and crying and asking and pleading that they give it to you. And, and he's standing there with the present extended, but you're, you're not receiving it. You're just crying and asking and, and please, please, please. And he's, he's got this present extended. I could just see that so easy. And I thought, well, take the present. Just simply receive. And I, for the first time, I just moved into a, a, a mode where absolutely I'm not worthy of any of this. I, but I need this. And so I just took. And I, I knew that something was different. And, and he said, Pen, just uh, anything the Holy Spirit gives you to say at this time, just say it out loud. And I, I said, I, I, don't have, I don't have anything to say. 
He said, well, let's just pray again. And, and if something comes to your mind in another language, just speak it out loud. Talk about pressure. All of a sudden, I was, <laughs> I was back to this again because part of my big problem, I could fail. I didn't realize there was no passing or failing. I, but I thought I could fail. I mean, I, I could disappoint him. Or what if I said something wrong? Or, you know, uh, and, and so, he, but he's so, it's so simple for him. And his confidence, he, he, I could hear confidence in his prayer. He believed it would happen. I wasn't, I wasn't sure. I was always unsure. And I thought, I, I like the feel of that confidence. It gave me confidence. He just expected it. And so, again, I, I, I went into a prayer time and very simply just pray, put his hand on my back and said, Father, give Pan a, a language today that he can pray to you and worship you in. And it was just so simple, such a simple prayer. And for, it seemed like an eternity, nothing happened. And then kind of beyond my head, I was all kind of, it wanted to experience it here, but it kind of surprised me because it, it came from my heart. It's like a word came, and I had the choice of saying it or not saying it. And it was so gentle and so, so simple. I wasn't expecting that. I was really, I was braced for the, for the fire hose experience, that there would be this rush. Because I'd read testimonies. I'd heard stories of people, you know, this uncontrollable experience. And I didn't want that, but I thought, if that's the proof of this whole thing, I want that. You know, I want, the, I want the proof of it. But this was different. This was very subtle. I could have almost missed it. It was so subtle. And I said, Pah. he says, is there something? I said, I think so. And he says, just, just say it out. And he was very gentle. Just, just say it out loud. And so I, I, I said, Shanana. He says, well, that's, that's wonderful. Say it again. Shanana. He says, well, praise God, Pen. That's, that's good. That's wonderful. Just keep saying that. And, and I said, well, thank you. It was so anticlimactic. <laughs> you know? I, I'd, I was so braced for lightning bolts and all this. It was just, it was so simple. And I, and I got my little car and I started driving home. And all of a sudden it hit me. There used to be this greaser band that had its own TV show called Sha Na Na. <laughs> and I thought, oh, you pulled that out of the past and you're just saying Sha Na Na because just to get him off your back or just to get the, the pressure off. And I, and I thought, oh, that's not tongues, that's you. That's just you saying Sha Na Na. Anybody could say Sha Na Na. Where's the tongues in that? And I was just, I I remember my shoulders sagging, and I just went home so discouraged and laid down on the couch, put my hand over my my eyes, and I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. It was like I was squeezing so much in this little dribble, little little droplet come out the other end, and and I was disappointed with the droplet. It wasn't wasn't anything I could impress anybody with. (laughs) Shanana. And this still small voice, I, so subtle I could have almost missed it, but it wasn't in line with my thinking or my mood, so I, I took it as that it had to be the Lord because it was different. And, he, and I, just this idea, more of an idea than a voice, and, and it just said, just use what you've been given. And I wasn't expecting that. That, that kind of validated it a little bit. And I thought, well, okay, all right, well... And we, we lived on Lake Ontario, and this is in Oakville, and, and there was a green strip, a long green strip, a park along the shore of Lake Ontario, and I could go there, and there were these gravel pro, uh, pathways, and I can go there and pray and, and walk. No one would hear me. And so I, I went out, and, uh, and I would pray in English and talk to the Lord, and then, then I would say, Shanana. <laughs> and it was just so flatlined, Shanana. Shanana. No feelings, no joy. Shanana. 
I could have been saying, shine my shoes. It didn't matter. It, it was about the same, same feeling. And so then I would just walk with him and pray and, and talk to the Lord. And, and every now and again, just say, shanana, shanana, shanana. And then all of a sudden, it doubled. Oh, shanana. Oh, shanana. I thought, hey, that's, that's growing. Oh, oh shanana, oh, shanana. And I honestly don't remember the moment. I, I wish I could. I just have no recollection of it at all. But I didn't know this. I didn't know the theory. I didn't know, I didn't know anything. Uh, but as I walked with Jesus and, and was talking to him and just saying, shanana, my heart was going from that to that to that. And I began just praising him, and, and gratitude kicked in. And I would just express thanksgiving to the Lord and praying gratitude, just thanking him for everything. And, and my heart, without knowing it, started to go like this. And I went from Oshanana, 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 Nana, Dara Kiri, Iri, Iri, Ondra Asara, Dara Hashondra Akababasa, Dara He Shere, and I, I was just all of a sudden fluent all, all these words words I couldn't even keep track of or remember or know if I was repeating all of a sudden I went from sh- shanana to shanana to without knowing it the more I forgot about me and the more I forgot about the the mechanics of speaking in tongues and I just focused on Jesus and and I went into gratitude and I and I really moved into gratitude I I love Jesus and I, I love what he was doing and without knowing it, I just went from, I went from this to this. And it wasn't him doling out the words. It was my own heart that was the inhibitor. And the more I relaxed and I focused on him and forgot about me, I just, he just threaded me like a needle. But I would never have got there if it was just left up to my mind, my own understanding, because I could never have figured any of that out. It's not something you just do with your head. It's something you just allow with your heart. Short while later, I was in the Christian bookstore, local Christian bookstore. There's a guy there that had a, a week's growth of beard on his face and a long trench coat. His hair was a mess. And, and, and he didn't look like anybody who would normally visit a Christian bookstore. And he's there, and, and, and I thought, Lord, there's, there's an unbeliever. Uh, can I talk to him about you? And, you know, I'm, try- I'm following him around the bookstore and he's kind of following me around the bookstore. And the- <laughs> There's just two of us. We're just kind of, and finally we came face to face and it was just one of those awkward moments. And, and uh, he said, I'm Tony. And, and, uh, and, uh, and I introduced myself. And next thing you know, I'm telling him about Jesus. And, and he's receptive. He's not resistant. He says, you know, I, I, I want this. I've been praying, asking God to help me. I, my girlfriend dumped me, and I've, got, I, I've been in the drugs, and I wrecked my life. And what you're talking about is what I need. And, and, and I, I prayed for him right then and there, and he received Jesus. My first convert. Portuguese kid named Tony. And uh, Tony became my first disciple, someone that I was so young in this thing, but anything I was learning... He'd say, tell me more. Tell me what... And I, well, I I'm, I'm just read the book. I don't know very much. I mean, I read Malachi and I read Job. and I mean, I really didn't know very much about it. But he was just so hungry. He didn't know what, that I didn't know anything. And, and I remember a short time later, he's at my dining room table. And, and he says, Pan, I want everything. What else is there? What else, tell me what else I could have. And I said, well, Tony, there's a thing called the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And he said, I want it. I, you don't even know what it is. I want it. I, I, I need it. I need everything. I, I need everything that there is. And, and I just thought I'd humor him. I didn't think he'd get it because he, he was just so rough and so new and he didn't know anything. And, and, uh, and so I walked down to his end of the table and I said, okay. I mean, he says, I want, pray for me. Put your hand on me and pray for me. And, 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 and I put my hand on, on Tony's head and he began speaking in the most beautiful fluent tongues and I got mad I, I said how does this work 
I squeezed. It was like squeezed in the toothpaste tube. And all I got was this little... After weeks of praying and fasting, and he's just... He doesn't even shave. And, and he just got it. He just got it so easy. And it, made, it kind of ticked me off. And I had to go back to Lauren and say, Lord, what was that about? How, you know, I was still kind of thinking merit. You kind of earn this stuff. Well, I realized that, you know, someone, and, and I've seen it since, people with a religious background usually have a harder time with all, with all this. People with no background, no preconceived notions, no biases for, no biases against, they're just, they can go from this to this so much easier. We've got, we've got merit we have to get past. We have to get, you know, the whole... Uh, I didn't. I didn't pray hard enough. I didn't. I didn't uh, tithe uh, two months ago when I, I went, when I went on vacation, and and I have had a dirty thought. And I've, had, you know, next thing you know, we don't think we're going to earn anything and get anything. They don't have that. They know they don't earn anything. They know they have nothing, which is an amazing advantage. And so what we have to do is we just have to go to where they are. You can't earn this. You can't earn one good thing that God has for us. And so we might better just go there as quickly as we can. You can't pray enough. You can't give enough. You can't, you can't do enough. You can't, you can't be uh, sanctified enough. You don't get the Holy Spirit because you're good. You get the Holy Spirit because he's good. You don't get the Holy Spirit because you have it all together. You get the Holy Spirit because you need somebody bigger than yourself to help you to get it together. And even then, you'll never get, it, you'll never get good enough. You'll never get good enough to earn anything in God. And so he's not deciding whether you're worthy to receive the Holy Spirit. He decided 2,000 years ago to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. It's, it's so, so less about you. And that was the big thing that Tony taught me by that experience. I thought, man, is that don't beat everything. I, here I thought I was trying to get all my ducks in a row so that I could get something, and he just gets it. And he, get, he, man, he got it fluently. I, 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 it had to be kind of pulled from me, and it, so to speak, and he just had it fluently. And I've watched that in all these years since because I, I've had the privilege of laying hands on hundreds of people and and see them come into the baptism of spirit. And there are people who just are so simple and so open. They know they don't deserve anything, and they can just receive. And I think that's the goal. Not once, but continually. Not once, but for the rest of your life. <coughs> and all the blocks and inhibition, inhibitions that I had during those early years are with me today. They're the same blocks that I struggle with today. When I get up and speak or when I'm supposed to uh, pick people out and prophesy to them, my heart starts like that, and, and I have to focus on Jesus and trust him. And next thing you know, it opens up a little bit and then a little bit more. And it's, for me, it's a process of, of, of opening my heart. And that becomes my focus rather than whether or not he will deliver, whether or not he'll be there on the other end of it. That part, if, that part is so secondary. It's, it's me opening my heart so that he can flow through me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, let's, let's act on this. Um, why don't we open our hearts? Why don't we open our hearts and, and, and not make it easy, what, where you have to come to the front? And you have to step over the threshold of, of your own worthiness and inhibitions. Why don't we do this? Why don't we come to the front throw open our hearts, even take the doors off the hinges if we can, and say, Lord, I want more from you. I, I want you to touch me. I want you to speak to me. If you need to receive Jesus, if you need to receive the Holy Spirit, if you need to receive tongues or prophecy, or whatever you need, let's, let's just become like little children who can't earn anything. And why don't we just come to the front today and, and reach out with our hearts and take are you up for that? Yeah. Do you want to experiment and try it and see what happens? Let's do that. Come on up front and we'll see what happens.